tonight's show, we're going to be talking out of the book of Romans, chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. There in that passage, it seems kind of like a mundane section of scripture because Paul's just listing a whole bunch of names and he's talking about people that he's saying hello to, to the church there in the city of Rome. He's talking about people who were friends of his, people who labored with him in the past, people who served with him, people who were saved through his ministry as he evangelized in various places and planted churches. But when we look at a list of names like that, and the Bible's filled with a lot of genealogies and listing of names. Sometimes we wonder, should we even read this? Should we study it? I think it's important. I think there's a reason that those passages have, are in the scriptures, that those names are there for us. I think it's very important that God saw it fit to have these names put in the book of Romans. It reminds us that God knows who we are that God desires to have a personal interaction and intimate relationship with us, that he wants to be a part of my life and your life. It also shows us that God takes note of those who are serving him. He takes note of those who are following him. He takes note of those who suffer for him, those who experience difficulty in life, who sacrifice things for his namesake. God knows about those things that people give up in this life for his namesake and he, he keeps record of it in heaven. And apparently he's keep it, taken record of it and kept it in the scriptures for us here. So I would encourage you to take some time to study this passage with us. Open your Bible, Romans chapter 16, and consider what it is that God has to say to us in this passage. We know what it is that people make themselves notable for in this life, but this life is passing. How can someone be worthy of note in eternal life? Stay tuned, check out the message, you'll see how. Study the book of Romans. So Romans chapter 16, we'll begin reading today at verse 1, Romans 16, 1, and as I do, you can pray that I am able to say these names right, <laughs> although you probably wouldn't know if I didn't. <laughs> verse 1, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Centuria that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner that is worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business that she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Epineatus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen and fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Greet Ampelias, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. Greet Stachus, my beloved. Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who are of the household of Nar Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Trephosa, who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Parissus, who labored much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Greet Asyncritus and Phlegon and Hermas and Petrobas and Hermes and the brethren who are with them. Greet Philologus and Julia, Nurus and his sister. Greet Olympus and all the saints who are with him. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Father, thank you for your grace to say those names correctly. <laughs> or at least how I think they're said. Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that, as we know, every jot and tittle has purpose. And even when we come to a section of Scripture that is filled with names of people that we do not know and we would not know here, this side of heaven, people who are of little fame outside of your word that maybe no secular historian has ever even considered, uh, Lord, we thank you that you've taken the time to put them here for a reason, and we pray that you'd help us to, in some part, unpack what that reason is. And God, that from it you would teach us. Lord, help us to make application from your word today, uh, now living some 2,000 years after these individuals lived. Lord, would you do a work in us uh, by the mere fact that their names are listed here. So God, teach us, give us insight and understanding and wisdom and God transform us by the work of your spirit and through your word so that we would reflect your glory 
and the world in which we live. This we ask in Jesus' name, and all God's people agreed, saying, Amen. 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 You can be seated. How does one become notable in the kingdom of God? How does someone become worthy of note in God's economy? Of course, we know what makes people famous, notable, celebrity in our world and in our day. Certainly, there are those who, because of their wealth, they are well-known. Maybe they are accomplished authors or actors or athletes in our society that makes someone worthy of repute. Maybe they have political influence and therefore they have power. They have a good business mind. And then, you know, in our day, strangely enough, although it is reality, there are those who have some of those things, but they're apparently not famous enough, and so they are seeking greater fame. They're seeking greater notoriety, and sometimes they choose the most strange ways to get it. Through promiscuity, they get caught with a prostitute. They get caught with a very high-dollar escort, and now that's what they're known for, not because of their political influence or power. Maybe it's a slip-up. They, they send a tweet they shouldn't have. They post a picture on Instagram that maybe wasn't a, meant to be. Or, you know, through some accident, some risque video that they produced ends up on YouTube and lots of views, so now they're very notable because of some video on YouTube. Or because of their, their loose morals, they, they've risen to some level of fame in our society. It's a phenomenal thing that these are the things that people place notoriety upon individuals for. They say or they do all kinds of off-the-wall things, and therefore they become well known. So we know that there are ways in which people become well-known in our culture, and the reality is, because of our fallen condition, we desire to be well-known. You may think back to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 11. There was, after the flood, as men began to multiply on the face of the earth, once again, there was a man who rose to prominence, rose as a leader. His name was Nimrod. I know that's an interesting one. And he called unto himself the men of his day and said, let's stop here, even though the Lord has told us to go throughout the whole earth and fill it. Let's stop here and let's make a name for ourselves. Wanted to build a tower up to the heavens to make a name for themselves. So this desire within fallen man, it's there. It's been there for thousands of years, the desire to be known, to make a name for oneself. But never in history has there been the ability, such as there is today, to make a name for yourself from just your cell phone, where otherwise you would not be known at all, and yet now people can, you know, be a blogger, or they can be, you know, their primary source of being known is that they send a lot of tweets on Twitter. It's a phenomenal thing. I was just reading an article the other day about this person who has risen to fame, and now she has a book deal in LA because she's sent something like 15,000 tweets, and she happens to be kind of funny in 140 characters or less. And now because of that, she's got notoriety. Although otherwise, she'd be a nobody. And I would say that in some ways, this is why these things have such great success. Why does Facebook have the pull that it does? Why does Facebook have so many users? In fact, how many of you today will be honest enough to admit you're a Facebook user? Lift up your hand, Facebook. Look at that. Most of the people in this sanctuary, Facebook users. Why is it that Facebook is so attractive to people? Why is it that Twitter sucks people into these sort of things? Well... Why is it that the American psychiatry you know, group, they now have a thing that they term Facebook depression? Wow. When people put up a picture or they put up a post and they don't get enough likes or they don't get enough comments and now they slip into a depression. These things cater to our narcissistic nature that desires to be known. 
It desires that people would like us. Don't you wish sometimes that there was an unlike button on Facebook? I mean, I, there's more things I unlike than like. But these are why these social media mediums are so successful, because we have a desire to be known. We have a desire to be great. We have a desire to be of note. You may get in this world 15 minutes of fame. You may get your day in the limelight on the stage for some of the craziest things. Perhaps you produce a crazy song and do a crazy dance, and now you've got Gangnam Style with 1.7 billion hits, which means that most of the people in this room have probably seen it. And if it's not that, then it's, what does the fox say? Oh, see, yeah, you were waiting for that. I know it. Some of you guys have no idea what that is. That's probably just fine. Anybody under 30 probably knows, what does the fox say? So, you know, these are the things that make people of note. And, and they get their 15 minutes of fame, even though they're out somewhere in Sweden and no one has a clue who they are. But the Apostle John in 1 John, he tells us that all that is in this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and this is what all this is surrounded with, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. All these things are passing away because the world is passing away. Amen. So people may have fame, they may have notoriety in this world, but if they do, it's temporary at best. So the question comes, how does one become eternally notable if this world is passing away? And I would say that in some part, Romans chapter 16, verses 1 through 15, answers that question. How does one become eternally notable? Consider the qualities mentioned in connection with the names that are noted here in Romans chapter 16. We see things like servants, saints, sacrificers. Succorers, the, New, the King James Version says, or comforters. So these are the things that made it so that these individuals, some 29 individuals who would be listed here, servants and saints and sacrifices and succorers, people who were serving the church, people who were serving the Apostle Paul, people who were fellow workers in the faith, people like Priscilla and Aquila there in verse 3 who were told in verse 4, risked their own necks for my life, Paul says. They were willing to sacrifice, sacrifice for the good of the church, and that's why all, verse 4 says at the end, all the churches of the Gentiles are thankful for these two people, Priscilla and Aquila. You can almost not imagine, if you've been a studier of the New Testament for any length of time, you can almost not imagine their names being separated. Anytime you see the name Priscilla, you expect Aquila. Anytime you see Aquila, you anticipate Priscilla. They, they have to be together, this husband and wife team who were told in the scriptures were Jewish believers who were living in Rome. Priscilla was actually a native of Rome, and in 49 AD, they were expelled from the city when Claudius Caesar, the emperor, said no Jew could live there in the city. And so Paul met them on his second missionary journey while he's in the city of Corinth, and they were instrumental in the church being planted and growing while Paul was there in that great city of Corinth. But Paul mentions other people that they're only listing in the scriptures is here in this passage. Other than this, we have no idea who they are. And many Bible teachers and historians have spent a lot of time studying and trying to figure out who are these people in these 15 verses. A couple of them, we believe, are noted in, some, in other historical contexts. They're noted by other historians in the ancient times. But for the most part, this is their only mention this side of heaven. And yet God saw it fit to allow their names to be here in the scriptures. Those who are beloved of Christ, those who were fellow workers. We have one who's mentioned here who was the very first convert in Achaia, Paul says. This individual was the first person to come to faith in Corinth when Paul began preaching the gospel there. And Paul says he's worthy of note here in this passage because when Paul wrote this letter some five or seven years later, he's still there. He's still a part of the church at Corinth. He's still a believer in and working hard, but now he's not in Corinth, he's serving God in Rome as a missionary. Awesome. 
And so God saw it fit that their names would be here in this passage, servants and saints, sacrifices and succorers. What are the qualities that make it so that one who would be of note, that one would be worthy of mention, an honorable mention, by God? Well, Jesus had something to say about this, in fact. You know, Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, he knows that it is in our heart the desire to be great. You know, for three years, three and a half years, as Jesus walked with his disciples, one of the most common topics of conversation among his disciples was this issue of greatness. No, they didn't want Jesus to know that they were talking about it. In fact, when he would ask them on a number of occasions, what are you guys talking about? Oh, nothing. (laughs) Oh, nothing. Caught in the act, discussing who would be the greatest. You know, two of Jesus' disciples, they were brothers, James and John. The Gospels tell us that at one point in Jesus' ministry, they approached Jesus and said, Lord, would you give us whatever it is that we ask? Now, you know, if someone butters you up in that way, you go, well, I don't know. know? I'm always leery when people come up and say, would you do me a favor? And I go, well, it depends. I don't know. What is the favor? And so here they, Lord, would you do whatever it is that we ask? There's a real wonder there. Who's the Lord in that scenario in their thinking? And so he asked them, well, what is it that you desire? Well, we desire that we would be on your right and on your left when you come into your kingdom. Well, he discussed that with him. We're told in the scriptures that the disciples, the rest of them, the ten that were also there, apparently watching as James and John approached the Lord. I mean, what gall these guys had. Can we be on your right hand and left hand? Essentially, can I be your prime minister? Can I be your defense minister? Because, of course, these are the guys that said, Lord, shall we call down fire from heaven upon that city over there? So the disciples, the other ten, weren't too excited about this question of James and John. But you know what? They didn't stop there because in another place in the Gospels, they got their mom involved in it. They figured, you can't say no to dear old mom. And so they had mom come and talk to Jesus and, Lord, I have a request for you. Would you bid that my sons would sit on your right and your left hand when you come into your kingdom? Greatness. Who is going to be great and of note in the kingdom? You know, one of the most phenomenal things to me about this discussion and about this whole topic in the Gospels is that Jesus never rebuked his disciples for the desire to be great. You know, we would imagine that he would say, it's wrong for you to think that way. Die to yourself. Take up your cross. Now, he did say things like die to yourself and take up your cross, but he never chastened or rebuked his disciples' desire to be great. Instead, he taught them how to become great. Would you turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew? Matthew chapter 20 first. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew 20. And look with me, if you will, at verse 26. Right about the middle of the verse, he says this, whosoever desires to become what? Great among you. Now, you can imagine that Jesus, his disciples were probably, oh, what's he going to say? Whosoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. Verse 27, whosoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. We'll turn from there to chapter 23, just a couple pages to the right. Matthew chapter 23. Jesus in Matthew chapter 23 is chastising the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day for their hypocrisy. And then in verse 11, we read this. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Verse 12, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Well, then from there, turn to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. 
This is that passage, Mark chapter 9. Actually, yeah, Mark 9, look at verse 35. It says, And he sat down, Jesus did, and he called the twelve. So now he bids his twelve disciples. He says, Come here, I want to talk with you. It's an amazing thing. Here is this rabbi that's being followed by multitudes of people there in Galilee throughout Israel. He's fed the multitudes. He's cast demons out of those who are possessed of them. He's healed the sick. He's raised the dead. Thousands of people are following him. And and there, if you were amidst those thousands of people, you'd want to be as close as you could to him. And yet there were 12 guys who were his inner circle, 12 guys that he had appointed to be with him, the scriptures say. And and they were with him at, at very you know, private times, whether he was praying or as he was out on the Sea of Galilee, they were in the boats, they were the posse, they were the groups, they were the inner circle, the groupies, and and I'm sure there were people that were envious of the twelve, and so here is, among the multitudes, Jesus calls the twelve to himself, and you can imagine, at least I can, that they were probably, well, yeah, we're the twelve. And they sit down, and he says to them there, after he calls the twelve to himself, if anyone desires to be first... He shall be last of all and servant of all. This is the teaching that we see from Jesus over and over again in the, or in the Gospels. Turn one more time to Luke chapter 14. Matthew, Mark, now Luke chapter 14. In verse 7. Luke 14, 7. There Jesus teaching as he often did with a parable. We read there, So he told a parable to those who were invited. I guess they were at a feast of some sort. When he noted how they chose the best places. So they're at some sort of feast and people are choosing the best places to be seated there. They were seated according to their rank, according to their honor. And so he, he spoke to those who chose the best places, saying to them, when you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him, the master of the ceremony. And when he is invited by him, he comes to you and says, give place to this man. You're in the wrong seat. And then you begin with the same shame to take the lowest place. But instead, when you're invited, go sit at the lowest place so that there, as you've humbled yourself, the master of the feast comes and says, no, no, you're supposed to be seated up here. So he's encouraging them to take the lower position. Who is great as Jesus teaches it? Those who serve, those who humble themselves, those who in Matthew chapter 5 were told who not only teach God's word but also do it. Those are the ones who are great in the kingdom of God. So once again, it's, it's amazing to me that he doesn't rebuke or chasten his disciples for their desire to be great. Instead, he says, this is the path to greatness in the kingdom of heaven. But the phenomenal thing is that Jesus is teaching on greatness is paradigm shifting because it's completely paradoxical to us, to our nature. This teaching from Jesus about greatness in the kingdom, not just 15 minutes of fame, not just your day in the limelight here in this world that's passing away, but to be worthy of note in eternity, to have an honorable mention. He says the path to this greatness, it's, it's countercultural to the world in which we live. It is unnatural to our sinful nature. Therefore, it is hard to live the way that Jesus says to live in this passage, but this is the path to greatness. Our culture is wholly given to self-preservation and self-promotion, and yet Jesus says the path to greatness in my kingdom is different. And it wasn't just Jesus' teaching, it was his example. Now, turn in your Bibles to the book of Philippians chapter 2. Jesus' example is given to us there in Philippians chapter 2. Verse 5. Paul the Apostle, the author of the book of Romans, also wrote this book, the book to the Philippians, he says there in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So have the same mindset as Jesus. Well, what was his mindset? Well, it was seen in the way that he lived. Who being in the form of God, he is God, King of kings, Lord of lords, occupying a throne in heaven for eternity, from eternity past to eternity on into 
Jesus occupies that throne. When Isaiah, some 700 years before Jesus came as a man, when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up in Isaiah chapter 6, he saw Jesus, the apostle John tells us. So there is the king enthroned in heaven. Being in the form of God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Another translation says, he did not consider that something to be grasped, to be held onto that position, but instead we're told that he made himself of no reputation. Now, imagine if you will, there he is in a position, the greatest position ever On the throne in heaven, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he thought that not a position to be grasped, but he made himself of no reputation. Can you imagine anyone in our realm doing a similar thing? Now, arguably the most powerful position in our nation and probably in the world would be the President of the United States of America. But even that person who occupies that office, and there haven't been many of them who've occupied that office, that person knows from the day they are sworn in with their hand up and one on the Bible at that 12 o'clock on January 20th, the countdown begins. And if they're lucky, they get eight years. But eight years later, on January 20th at 12.01 p.m., someone else takes their spot. And they, although they want that position, no doubt they want that position, there's a part of them that probably says, I don't want to leave it. Why? Because every time they walk into a room, people stand. Do you realize that the President of the United States through his entire term in office never has to wait at a red light? He's in this beast of a car with police in front of him with lights on and they just drive through every red light. How cool would that be? I hate red lights. And not only that, not only does he drive around in this vehicle, but then they take him to a 747 that's his own personal airplane. And when he gets on, they call him and he says, okay, it's time for us to take off. He gives the command to take off, and they don't wait in line at JFK. And he doesn't go through security, doesn't have to take his shoes off and have the TSA pat him down. If he did, he'd probably make some changes to that whole thing. But there is that position, and you can imagine that there's a part that says, I don't want to let this go, but he knows that day is coming, 12.01 p.m. on January 20th, when gone is that position. And then they say, you get one last free ride on the plane, and then we're taking it back. And you got to wait in red lights again. Sorry, but that's the reality. And then even after that, they don't make themselves as no reputation. They still go about trying to make a reputation. But Jesus, he made himself of no reputation. And he came to be... A servant, a slave, bondservant means a slave by choice and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself even further than that lowest position, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now maybe the clearest illustration of this, aside from the incarnation, that is God becoming a man, aside from that, the clearest illustration of this is in John chapter 13 when Jesus washes his disciples' feet. He takes and puts a towel upon him, does the lowest of the low of the work of the lowest slave, washing his disciples' feet. One of his disciples even chastises him for doing it. Peter said, you're not supposed to do this. He recognized that this wasn't the position for their Lord and their master. It wasn't their position for their Lord and their teacher to be doing this thing that he's doing. In fact, after he does this, in verses 12 through 14 of John chapter 13, he says, you call me rabbi and Lord. So here I am washing your feet and you call me rabbi and Lord. And I am, you say right. And if I have done this, then you ought to do likewise. I'm giving you an example that you should follow. He's not instituting a new sacrament that we should have foot washing ceremonies. He's saying, no, your Lord and your master, if he's going to take the lowest position, then you, by all means, ought to take the low position as well. You say, well, but I don't know that I want to do that. That's countercultural. It's unnatural. Well, notice this. You're still in Philippians. Look at verse 9. Look at the first word of Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. What is it? Therefore. Would you circle that? Circle that word, therefore. Because of what Jesus did in verses 5 through 8, therefore, because of that, God, the Father, has highly exalted him, Jesus, given him a name which is above every name. 
given him a name that is above every name. Jesus' name is so powerful, so glorious, that men who hate him use his name as a curse word to express disgust. That, that shows us just how powerful his name is. You never hear people going around saying, oh, Miles de Benedictus. <laughs> you just don't. At least I haven't. Maybe you do. I don't know. <laughs> you never even hear people going around and saying, oh, Muhammad. Why? Because his name is not a name above every name. But even those who use his name as a curse word to express disgust, notice what's going to happen one day, that at the name of Jesus, one day, this is coming, this is prophetic, verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So this day is coming. Now, why does he have the name above every name? Because he humbled himself. So Jesus tells us in his teaching and exemplifies there in the scriptures that the path to greatness is the path of humility in this life. Being a servant of all. This is why the Apostle Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. Walk in love. How? As Christ also loved us and gave himself for us as an offering and sacrifice to God as a sweet-smelling aroma. So there... Paul says, if you want to know how to walk, then you walk as Jesus walked, sacrificially, as a servant. That's what is becoming of the saints. That's why he says in that same passage, walk worthy of the calling wherewith you've been called. What calling? Well, he calls you his saints. So we have here in Romans chapter 16 a list of names. A list of names that outside of the scripture may not be known There are not big history books written about Tryphena and Trophosa. When you hear their names, two women, it's interesting. There's there's ten ladies mentioned in this passage, which is phenomenal when you remember the historic context that this was written in the first century Jewish world and Roman world. In our world, it probably wouldn't be that big a deal. In our world, maybe you'd see more women's names. But to see ten women listed in this passage, phenomenal in the historical context. But you see Tryphena and Trophosa, and we imagine them probably to be sisters, maybe even twin sisters, and you'll never find an an earthly, secular, historical book written on on Tryphena and Trophosa, and yet their names are written here in the scriptures. But let me tell you something else. Their names are written in a much greater book, a book that is in eternity, the book called the Book of Life. The Book of Life. We're told about this book in the book of Revelation. There's there's several books that are mentioned that are in eternity. There are the books in in which people's names are listed with the works that they did, and they're going to be judged by the works that they did one day, and they will be damned. But there's another book, the book of life. I don't know about you, but though I may never be known in this world, though I may never have... You know, you put in Miles to Benedictus and get two million hits on, on Google. Though You may never have that here in this life, in this world. If your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you are of honorable mention in eternity. You may never have 15 minutes of fame in this world, but you're of honorable mention in eternity and far better to be of note in eternity than 15 minutes of fame here. Amen? Amen? So the question is, how, how does that come to be? Well, it's not, of course, by doing any magnificent work. Your name is not written in that book because you performed a miracle. Your name is not written in that book because you rose the dead. Your name is not written in that book because you preached to thousands or saw many people come to faith because of your work here on earth. It has nothing to do with your works. It has to do with the work that Jesus did on the cross and your trust and faith in him. Amen. Countercultural, unnatural. You put your faith, your trust in him for salvation, and he writes your name in the book of life. Oh, to be of note in heaven. Might I encourage you to live in such a way that you are of note in heaven. 
We have the teaching of Jesus. We have the example of Jesus, who Jesus in John chapter 13, after he washed his disciples' feet, after he told them that he has given this to them as an example, he says in verse 34, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. You live in this way to be of note. Would you stand with me and let's pray? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you saw it fit to have these names be written here in Scripture. I believe for a purpose. And Lord, I thank you that I'm absolutely certain because the work that you did, Jesus, that my name is written in heaven in that book of life. Lord, I I pray that you'd help me to live in such a way that on that day when I enter into your kingdom, I hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Servant. Lord, although we're sinners, we've been made saints, help us to be servants, those willing to sacrifice as you sacrifice, those willing to reach out and be your hands, comforting others who are in need of it. Lord, work in us to be like you. We thank you, Jesus.